let me just introduce myself. I'm Patrick Foley. I'm from Arise Festival and from the Labour Assembly Against Austerity. And I'm pleased to welcome you to today's session, this afternoon session, which is entitled Fight the Tories, Not the Left, Defending Labour Party Democracy and Our Socialist Principles. Today's event is hosted by Arise Festival, uh, along with a, a, a number of other left organisations, campaigns and publications. We're delighted to have so many different speakers and organisations join us today for this second session and to bring people together from across Labour's left for such an important discussion. As you all know, we do believe in discussion on the left, but we also believe in unity in action. And as speakers from five different organisations and publications will no doubt show us, it's vital that socialists in the Labour Party are unified in the struggle to defend both party democracy and the left policies built over the last years. We have seen a failure to publish the Ford report months after it was due. Attacks on members' democratic rights, including in Liverpool and Scotland for candidate selections. And most recently, in the London region this month, with the imposition of a summer conference against the wishes of our elected party board in the region. Of course, there was also the, the suspension of Jeremy Corbyn and the subsequent refusal to restore the whip to him. Alongside this, we've seen a worrying drift to the right on policy in a number of key areas, combined with a failure to really take the fight to the Tories at such a critical time. It's very clear that our work is cut out for us. The political corruption and cronyism surrounding public sector contracts in the pandemic, exemplified by the complete failure of Sarko's track and trace programme. We've had David Cameron's lobbying scandal, just the tip of the iceberg of a much more systemic problem, and of course, the increasingly authoritarian legislation from Boris Johnson, of which we'll cover more about the resistance later in the day at another session this afternoon. We, we need a unified movement to tackle all of this. We need a unified movement to fight for transformative change and much, much more. As this session goes on, please post your questions in the Q&A on Zoom. And if you're watching us uh, on YouTube, just post your question as a comment and we have a few volunteers there who'll pick through them and pass them on to us. Um, we'll, we'll be putting them to our panel later in the session. I'd also like to just take a moment just to say, if you are able to, please donate £10 or whatever you can afford through the link provided so that Arise Festival can continue to host these important events. Please keep, also keep an eye out for campaigns to, to support and other links put in the chat throughout the session. Uh, there'll be some key actions, some more about our speakers and so on. Our speakers for this discussion on the crisis and the alternatives we need will all speak for eight minutes and then we'll move on to questions. So uh, I think we'll begin now and I'd like to introduce Rachel Garnham, who's speaking on behalf of the Campaign for Labour Party Democracy. So Rachel, if you're with us, over to you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Patrick. Um, I wasn't expecting to go first. Um, thanks for um, inviting me to speak on such a brilliant panel of activists. And I think it is so helpful for Arise to have brought us all together from our different organisations, uh, as you were saying, Patrick, um, because only through working together, focusing on what we have in common and not what divides us, um, can we hope to defend and advance Labour Party democracy. I just really wish we were all together in person and could continue these conversations in the pub afterwards. Um, uh, I wanted to talk first about um, the elections we had in May and how the outcomes demonstrate how crucial party democracy is. And secondly, some concrete actions over the next few months that we can take to defend and advance party democracy. So I think the elections that took place in May could not have been clearer in demonstrating the type of coalition that Labour needs to build to win. Rather than chasing the, the older, more con socially conservative Brexit supporters, which seems to be the Union Jack strategy proposed by the current leadership, where Labour did well, it was predominantly in areas where it offered a genuine alternative to the Tories and was seen to challenge the government, not ride along on its coattails. Um, I think for young people in particular, as we know, this, the status quo is not a good option um, on housing, on jobs, on funding for higher education. Labour has to not only offer a genuine alternative to the neoliberal consensus that has dominated government since the 1970s. It also has to be seen to be standing up for something different and standing up for younger people. It is scary how much Labour's polling has reduced amongst young people, where over the past five years that has been a real strength not only support for Labour but young people actually getting out and voting Labour and the impact of offering clear red water um, was demonstrated most clearly in Wales where 
the expression was first coined, I think, by Rodri Morgan, but where Mark Drakeford as leader and now governing on a programme of people first, investment not cut, supporting public services, has been able to regain majorities in seats lost in 2019, whereas we can see where the alternative strategy leads us in, in Hartlepool. And, you know, it was a really significant victory for, for Welsh Labour in the, in the Senate elections. And that is a direct outcome of party democracy. Mark was elected on a left platform because of the campaign by grassroots members and trade unionists. And I believe he would have found himself happily ousted by Keir, given half a chance in the same way Keir backed the coup against Richard Leonard in Scotland. So a direct result of Labour Party democracy is, has meant a huge benefit to people in Wales and not just to people who are lucky enough to live under a Labour government in Wales, but actually to all of us in demonstrating that a centre-left Labour government is not only possible, but successful. Um, so it's quite clear that a, a democratic party is the way of ensuring our leaderships at every level are in touch with grassroots members and trade unionists, and therefore in touch with the communities we need to win support to win elections. And one of the most frustrating mantras of the current leadership is that we need to speak to voters, not members, like members are some class apart. Ignoring that for a start, members are voters embedded in, in touch with communities and a great conduit to other voters. And secondly, that you how unless you have energized and inspired activists, who is going to do all this talking to voters? You know, and, and genuine two-way communication, not just sort of from the pages of the Daily Mail. So I think we saw in May how uninspired members were relative to the past few years to knock on doors and have those important conversations. Members are more than knocker fodder. There has to be genuine engagement too. People have to feel they're part of a movement. So what do we need to do? Um, our current democratic structures include members' rights to select candidates, to agree policies, to organise at a local level, to promote lo labour values. But we know that party democracy is under attack, and I'm sure other people will talk about this more, but the, the imposition of candidates, the abuse of disciplinary processes, um, and Starmer's, you know, really crucially, actually, Starmer's disregard of the pledges on which he was elected. Um, we, at, as grassroots members, need to continue to not only defend what we have, but and and draw attention to what is actually in the rule book, but make the most of the available processes. And I wanted to give three quick examples. Firstly, Labour Party Women's Conference takes place two weeks today. The left, through coming together as part of grassroots Labour Women, which I'm sure Pamela will talk more about, has ensured that we have the most nominations for the Women's Committee. We have seen plenty of um, our mo model motions submitted. Um, from CLPD and we're really optimistic about the debates that we can have at the conference on Palestine, on climate crisis, on issues impacting women not only in Britain but across the world. Uh, uh, but there's plenty of work to do to win at the conference and to build the new women's organisation that we need and to replicate what we have been trying to achieve in the women's uh, structures ac across the other equality strands. So, um, I will give a quick plug to say do visit CLPD's website and sign up if you're a delegate to Women's Conference so that we can be in touch, we can organise around the compositing, etc. Um, secondly, we have very important elections to the Conference Arrangements Committee taking place through one member, one vote over the summer. We've got two excellent candidates in Billy Hayes and Seema Chandwani who have a track record of fighting for a democratic conference and we absolutely need their commitment and their experience to try and keep fighting for a democratic conference um, and these OMOV um, elections were a, a CLPD rule change that predates Jeremy's leadership and it will but it will be uh, just to show that even without the leader you know you, you can make democratic change um, but it will be hard this time around as it's got a low profile, we're, we're losing members, we need to work together, all the organisations on this call and many more to, to get out the vote in those elections. And finally, we expect to have an annual conference where we can hope to elect our very excellent candidates for the National Constitutional Committee, who will stand up for natural justice and members' rights. Uh, we can promote motions to maintain a left popular platform as we are trying to do at Women's Conference, to build the coalition I was referring to earlier and um, people might have heard CLPD is promoting a rule change to make the PLP accountable to annual conference 
which would not be before time, um, and according to media reports, could restore the wit to Jeremy Corbyn. Um, and I strongly believe Jeremy should not be forgotten. He's a Labour Party member cleared by our disciplinary processes. He's an MP. He has to be restored to the PLP to start to rebuild the coalition we need. And it isn't easy, and there are many hurdles, and, but... And this is a very long fight, but as we heard in the earlier session, in 2017 we showed against all the odds that a left Labour government could be possible, and only through defending and making the most of party democracy can we hope to win that transformational Labour government in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. That, yeah, that was that was brilliant. I think uh, just, just a few of the key actions you mentioned there are really important. I, I think our volunteers actually will be putting uh, a link to to call for the whip to be restored back to Jeremy Corbyn in the chat. I think it's up to 46,000 supporters so far, so far. So do really um, do add your name to that. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned the, the Women's Committee elections because our, our next speaker uh, is a candidate in the Women's Committee elections. She's also the vice chair of the Labour Representation Committee the, or the LRC, um, and that is Pamela Fitzpatrick. So Pamela, if you're with us, over to you, please. Thank you, Patrick, and thank you, Rachel, for starting us off, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I want to start off with a quote, which some of you will probably recognise, quite a famous one, and it's quite appropriate. It's from 1935, I think. So it goes, life is not an easy matter. You cannot live through it without falling into frustration and cynicism, unless you have before you a great idea which raises you above personal misery, above weakness, above all kinds of perfidy and baseness. And um, for many of us, life in 2021 is not an easy matter, is it? At a time when we desperately need big political ideas, the Labour leadership is busy attacking its own members. Frustration and cynicism are now widespread and we're witnessing an exodus of members from the Labour Party. Many are in despair at the apparent demise of the left, the lack of any great ideas or leadership, and indeed the perfidy, great word, and baseness of some in our own party, let alone the Tories. So where are we in 2021? We have obscene levels of poverty in the UK, not by accident, but by design. They're unnecessary. We're one of the wealthiest economy in the world. And we're also, I think, fifth for hosting the most millionaires. But those in work increasingly can expect to work on zero hours contracts for very low pay. Welfare benefits have been decimated, reduced to such a level that those who cannot work due to ill health, disability, or for example, caring responsibilities, have insufficient income to meet the very basic needs of keeping a roof over their head and food on the table. And with the decimation of council housing and the myth of affordable housing, we've returned for many to slum housing. Few people can ever hope to own a home. That's a dream, a pipe dream. Instead, we've got an ever increasing number of people who will forever pay extortionate rents to landlords for poor quality overcrowded accommodation. And the short term nature of tenancies means that families can't put down roots in a community because they've got to move from one year to another. Young people who aspire to study are left with debts of 50 to 100,000 pounds and are coming out of university and can only find jobs in pubs and bars on zero hours contracts. Domestic abuse has soared and the trafficking of women forced into prostitution has been found to be on an industrial scale. Yet the support services so needed have suffered massive cuts in funding. Savage cuts to legal aid often mean that women are forced to remain with their abusers. But the scant regard for the very lives of working class people is the thing that stands out over recent years. It's vividly illustrated by the government response to the COVID-19 pandemic. A government content to see the bodies piled high, so long as its donors and mates could make a fast buck. Greed and incompetence of those in power have allowed 152,289 people to die in 15 months unnecessarily. But it's not just COVID that has led to deaths of ordinary working class people. A new study accuses the Tory government of economic murder and estimates that the austerity policies of cuts to benefits and public services just over a four year period have led to 120,000 deaths. 
Now, the government dispute that. They say only 81,140 people died in four years. So that's OK, I guess. So we're suffering a housing crisis, a health crisis, a poverty crisis, and our services are collapsing around us. It should be obvious to anybody that what is desperately needed at this time is a socialist government. Yet we have a leadership unable to even utter the word socialist, unable to commit to socialist policies, and unable to offer an alternative to the abject poverty and injustice in the UK today. Instead of attacking the Tories, I mean, it's a gift to them at the moment, but instead of doing that, what are they doing? They're embarking on a relentless campaign against its own members. So everybody in the UK should have a roof over their head with rents that are genuinely affordable. Everybody's entitled to food on the table of their choice, not to be given a food parcel by a food bank. Everybody's entitled to work for a living wage and to expect that there is a comprehensive social security system that will be there for the times when they cannot work. These are the very, very basic necessities of life, not luxuries. And if Labour politicians can't see this, if they cannot fight for this, they are in the wrong party. It's as simple as that. All the successes, all the gains made for a better life have come from the struggles of working class people, not from politicians, certainly not those who've run government departments. And without those revolutionary struggles, we would not have achieved shorter working hours, social security benefits, free education, pensions, healthcare, etc. But many of those gains have been wiped away and our rights to protest are in danger of being severely curtailed. Yet the very people supposed to represent the interests of working class people in Parliament stand silently by or even support the government. Um, we have at the moment, I've had messages today, two types of messages. First from young people telling me that the Labour Party have embarked again on expelling Marxists from the Labour Party. Not because you've broken any rule, but simply it's a kind of ideological thing now within the Labour Party. So if you're a student, you join the Marxist Federation or something, you can find yourself expelled. It's kind of forgetting the history of our party and who is entitled to be in it. The other thing I've heard is that in Harrow, in my own area where I live, there's a demonstration, a huge demonstration, anti-abortion. I've not seen an anti-abortion demonstration for decades, yet this is the climate that we're living in. So what do we do? It can be quite depressing. As um, Rachel has said, I'm standing for the Labour, the National Women's Committee, and that's what we have to do. We have to organise and fill every part of the Labour Party and every part outside of the Labour Party to organise and mobilise people. And again, I've got a, a quote from somebody else over a century again, which some of you may be familiar with, which it is, um, all our strength, all our hope lies in organization. Now our slogan must be comrade, women workers, do not stand in isolation. Isolated we are but straws that any boss can bend to his will, but organized we are a mighty force that no one can break. And I don't think that we on the left understand our strength. There are 500,000, maybe slightly less now, but roughly half a million people in the Labour Party, more of which share our views than they share the views of the leadership or the parliamentary Labour Party. We just don't understand that strength. Many people are in despair at the moment, but I'm optimistic because I can't remember a time when we've had so many strikes in the workplace, demonstrations on the streets against all of this. And we need to mobilize and spend less time arguing amongst left organizations and more time coming together in left unity and organizing against the true forces that are undermining our rights. If we have a situation such as Victor Orban mentioned this week that women's only purpose is to have children. Many of you have heard that have sent a shiver through me combined with the anti-abortion marches, the attacks on our democratic rights to protest, we have to mobilize, we have to organize at every level. So on a very small scale, I'm standing for the Women's Committee, please ensure that your delegates vote for all six left candidates. Um, go to CLPD to see who we all are, but we absolutely have to stand solidly together and fight. That's the only thing we can do. Thank you for that, Pamela. Thank you. Um, you know, it's, it's clear how many fronts we actually are fighting on as, as a movement. And uh, 
I'd like to echo your optimism as well and talk about how we can draw strength from those on the front line resistance to the Tories who have been, you know, guiding the way when at a time we've been lacking vision and, and ideas from the leadership. So there is there is hope to be drawn from that. We are a big movement and we can be a unified movement for change. Um, I'd like to introduce now Mr. Rahman and Mr. is uh, a member's representative on the Labour NAC and he's also on the Momentum National Coordinating Group. So thanks for joining us, Mish, and over to you. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, thank you for inviting me to my first Arise Festival and on a panel with such great inspirational comrades. Uh, comrades, for working people, the road to recovery is going to be a long one because uh, from unemployment to rent arrears, there are huge challenges ahead. And as you know, a decade of austerity has left our British society completely unprepared for this pandemic. The scale of national suffering has been immense and we've endured one of the highest per capita death tolls in the world. But the elites, they've continued to profit from their crony deals with their Tory mates and the rest of us have paid the cost. Billionaires increasing their wealth by over 25 billion pounds during the pandemic, while a third of adults are still living in hardship. Instead of new ideas, the Tories are stealing as from a national infrastructure bank to raising corporation tax, but they're downsizing them and they're severing the con connection between these policies and our fundamental project, which is shifting the balance of power in society away from the elite and towards ordinary working people. A socialist Labour Party wouldn't just spend money on trying to reduce the impact of inequality, will just totally take apart the power imbalances that create that inequality in the first place. And our Labour Party needs to take on a government that's willing to invest in order to save the rigged system. And that means it needs bigger and bolder ideas. So we need to demand investment in public services and the wealth tax and to step up and demand that workers will not pay for this crisis. The 1946 budget, that famous Clement Attlee budget, laid out a vision for a social state, an NHS, uh, education for workers' children. Nothing like that has appeared following the pandemic. And we have a Labour Party leadership who doesn't have any ideas, any vision or an identity. As it is right now, it's left to the trade unions, our left organisations, Momentum and all the other organisations on the left to defeat, fire and rehire to protect jobs, to get a 15% pay rise for the NHS, to get a minimum wage that reaches £15 an hour. And it's going to be the trade unions and the left organisations who are speaking up for the wealth tax, to see rights extended to the gig economy, and to speak up for saving the planet by creating green jobs that build clean engines for cars and planes, that manufacture wind farms, and see the investment needed for hydrogen to be the new clean energy. Now, that's all good, but what is the Labour Party doing? The Labour Party should be championing this vision, working with the left and the trade unions for the betterment of ordinary working people. As Rachel just said, the party speaks about being public facing, but their version of public facing is different to what we perceive. Speaking to the public is one way, but the main way to reconnect with the public is to embed your activism in your communities. So we've got to de defeat division with solidarity, and we've got to build the wealth in our communities through goodwill, mutual aid, and all of the campaigns that we do. Only turning up during the election cycle is recognised as disingenuous by the public, and the Labour Party's got to be recognised in the community for its actions. So community organising is vital for socialists to embed themselves with all the actions within the community they do, from the local book club, to the food bank, to the mutual aid group, to the party street store, to creating a community hub. It's no accident that places that have a socialist vision do well in elections and their reputations are built through years and years of community cohesion. We can't end this subject without talking about the Labour Party and the neoliberal right wing's fascination with kicking the left and not the Tories. They wax lyrical about how the Labour Party grew and the public embraced new Labour. Yet, as always, they never apply any context or analysis of the time. While we agree every so often, the general non-Labour voting public, despite backing the Conservatives, do desire for change because we have seen our governments after long periods in office inevitably collapse, such as Howard, Harold Wilson in 1964, Margaret Thatcher in 1979, and Tony Blair in 1997, all swept to power on the back of their opponents' collapse. 
The context is important. Labour are not going to win back power by attacking the left and not having anything to beat the Tories with, except for just hoping for a collapse. They reminisce about the 90s, but other than positives such as Shaw Start, the introduction of the minimum wage, due to their Tory-like neoliberal Blairite politics, they refuse to reverse Tory trade union legislation. They refuse to regulate the buy-to-let landlord boom. They refuse to regulate banks. They refuse to regulate utilities. They refuse to look at Hillsborough because of their association with Rupert Murdoch. They eroded legal aid. They privatised prisons. They gave us PFI and the start of the NHS privatisation. They gave us tuition freeze. They created a hostile environment, created detention centres such as Yarswood. They invaded Iraq with lies, spins and distortions. And they gave us prevent spying on Muslims. And they gave us those champions of morality and honesty and decency, such as Phil Woolers and Alistair Campbell, Peter Mandelson and, oh, the expenses scandal. They removed close four. They lost four million voters between 1997 and 2010, as well as half of the membership. So don't you dare centrist, moderate, neoliberal Labour guy come and tell the left to do one. Don't tell communities they have nowhere else to vote because you're out touring Tory days are over. The Tories are starting to economically out Labour Labour, but with a sadistic, extreme, sneaky version, which is fooling the public. So focus your attention solely on the Tories, build bridges with members, build bridges with the left, it's up to the leadership to build empathy with members and activists. And it's not the other way around. To defeat the Tories, we ne you need the left. You need our politics. You need our activism. Because without us, you're just a Blairite tribute band. And that's just history. Thank you, comrades. Thanks for that, Mish. Uh, I, I want to pick up on you know something that you've, you've said quite strongly there. And, and it's been echoed with by our other speakers today as well. And it's that members are an asset to this party. They're not a hindrance. And I think a lot of us have felt over the last year, you know, we felt sidelined, we felt put away. We don't, they, don't, they don't really want to engage with, with members. It's almost like there's a drive to bring down the membership where actually members are a huge asset embedded in communities. Like you said, they can make a huge impact uh, and members are best engaged when they are united around a vision for transformative change, for to actually make the world a better place rather than sort of some trumped up PR campaign that might have a few British flags waving in the background. Um, I'd like to now introduce our next speaker, who's Maya Kirby, um, from, who's speaking on behalf of Save Our Socialists. So I'd be really interested to hear what Maya has to say. Over to you, Maya. Thank you very much, Patrick. And thanks for inviting uh, me and Save Our Socialists to speak today. So suspension, which is really what I'm going to talk about. Um, it's the favourite weapon of the Labour right. Uh, 2016, uh, in a vain attempt to influence the leadership election, uh, they suspended thousands of activists. Uh, since then, they've used it to influence internal elections, affiliate elections, to discredit uh, people, uh, to uh, in, invite in hostile media attention, um, to prevent uh, CLPs from meeting. Um, I mean, it's it's awful. In November 2020, uh, December 2020, they suspended around 70 CLP officers um, for allowing their members to express solidarity with Corbyn. It's uh, absurd. Uh, and it wasn't all CLPs who expressed solidarity with Corbyn, uh, it really depended on what region you're in, uh, which shows that despite the fact regions are not supposed to have any um, power to uh, in disciplinary matters, uh, in the north they had no appetite for suspending socialists, in the southwest they went to town and look what happened, they uh, lost Bristol Council to the Greens. Um, and suspension in the Labour Party is not like suspension in a the workplace. There's no investigation beforehand. There's no time scale. Uh, you can be suspended for years and you don't know what you're suspended for. So there are a lot of examples of this. People have been suspended for years. Uh, they're still paying their membership fees, um, but there's been no effort at all to resolve their case. Other people suspended for no reason, don't know why they're suspended, can't stand in their AGMs. Uh, and so, you know, increasing the chances of the right taking hold of those um, CLP. So, anyway, I don't want to talk the whole time about how nasty uh, this this is. It, it is really 
takes a huge toll on uh, members because it's isolating you know although it's an attack against the left um, communities it's really individualized so it leaves people very isolated and unable to go to their meetings and talk to their comrades uh, but I don't want to talk about that um, completely because this is a festival of ideas uh, so I want to talk about um, amongst the very many bad consequences of the recent attacks on the left uh, one good consequence that came out of it, and, and that is that we started organising in new ways. We started organising nationally in a way that we hadn't done before. Um, so prior to Jeremy's suspension, we had uh, a group of CLP secretaries um, that were, were on Facebook. Um, uh, but uh, it wasn't until David Evans issued guidance around not expressing solidarity with Corbyn uh, in your meetings that CLP secretaries started to come together uh, and we uh, put together a letter uh, which was in the end signed by 284 uh, CLP secretaries and chairs across 194 constituencies. So think about how many constituencies we hold. I mean, that's it's really impressive. Um, and when we started to hear about our comrades being suspended uh, in November, December, um, we just couldn't allow David Evans to control the narrative on this. You know, these are CLP secretaries uh, and chairs and vice chairs, officers who had poured so much energy in the to the 2019 general election campaign uh, and to keeping their CLPs like healthy and thriving uh, communities. Um, and attempting to demonize them was just so outrageous. So. One of the things about Labour Party suspensions is you're not allowed to talk about them. So what we decided to do instead was to publish biographies um, of uh, the officers who'd been suspended. So in 24 hours, we set up a Facebook, a Twitter and a, and a website and we started publishing um, these uh, biographies. So pictures of the officers, a uh, little bit about them, uh, you know, their story. Uh, we also set up meetings with um, MPs and other left organisations and asked for endorsements. And those endorsements really helped to kind of grow our audience for the campaign. Um, so that was really great. And, and the support was brilliant. Um, we had a lot of fun with it. So we did um, singing, <laughs> we did our own lyrics to songs, New Year's Eve, uh, Christmas, uh, we uh, did comedic Twitter storms, Ask Dave, hashtag, um, we uh, also did a show on Social Think Tank, uh, so we had a lot of fun. Uh, we realised as well that our community, there were a lot of talented people, um, so we could put on legal advice Zooms for people who'd been suspended and kind of create a community of suspended officers because it was a collective attack on the left, but as I say, very individualised. And uh, it was really good for people to feel that we they could share how they were going to answer their disciplinary questions, um, how to get information from legally through uh, legal channels, how to get information out of the party as to why they'd been suspended and how. Um, so that was brilliant. Um, so really, um, we created a community and I suppose that it has, is what's been a really great thing to come out of that. And we've got a community of uh, left secretaries. And we also, although this whole suspension of officers has had, you know, a big demoralizing effect uh, upon people. We actually, as, as Pam said earlier, we hold a lot of ground still in the Labour Party. Uh, and as uh, Rachel said, uh, and as Mish said, we've got the ideas, you know, they have nothing but despair. They've got the politics of despair. Uh, they're the ones gleefully creating the environment that make us make makes us feel as if we can't uh, have space for those ideas but we have the ideas we have the people and we have those communities but there is a lot of space for us to still build um, so we've spent the last five years building a wonderful community of activists in uh, Hackney North um, really fantastic lovely people and, and I hope our community will go on for years and years and years and all over the country those little communities have been formed there's so much more we can do now uh, with zoom culture um, in connecting around roles that we hold in the party around campaigns um, you know there 
there is a lot of ground that still need, can be filled and explored um, by uh, socialists in the Labour Party. And as Mish said, it needs to be around community organising, around union, uh, fight fire and rehire, um, all of those things. And, and we can do that. We can build those networks. Uh, so, yeah, on, on that note, uh, I want to say thank you to all the inspirational CLP secretaries that I've had the pleasure of working with. Um, this last uh, few, you know, several months, um, they, they've been absolutely fantastic. And yeah, just to reiterate uh, what Pam said, organise, organise, organise. Um, we've got a world to win. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thank you for that, Maya. Uh, very, very interesting to hear about organising across the country. Um, and on, on that subject, you know, for, for support of Jeremy and, 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 and the ideas that he stood for, um, just to say it one more time, we, we do have a petition going around, uh, restore the whip to Jeremy Corbyn, there's over 46,000 people have signed so far, uh, so please help us get it up to 50,000 if you can, um, share it, sign it, everything else. Uh, again, I'd, you know, the, the, the themes of community organising and actually solidarity between activists is, is quite, is very strong and quite uplifting today, um, particularly hearing that from from Maya, we often forget that actually we meet a lot of like-minded people when we're out on the road. We meet a lot of people who are comrades, who are friends, and and uh, it's, it's a very positive positive experience when when we do come together. Um, I'd now like to introduce uh, the editor of uh, Tribune magazine, the fantastic Tri Tribune magazine, which is Ronan Burtonshaw. I had the pleasure of interviewing Ronan for Labour Outlook back in March on an actual on a, on a fairly similar topic. So I'd be delighted to hear. Um, his thoughts and also what, what's changed since then. So thanks so much, Ronan, uh, over to you. Thanks, Patrick. Um, and thanks to all the, the previous speakers, uh, Rachel, Pamela, Mish, Maya, uh, and to all the organizers in Arise. Um, this, this work is really, really important to, to try to build a community around socialist ideas um, and to, to keep people uh, in contact and to give them a, a space to do some organizing while they're under attack inside the party and in wider society as we are at the moment. Um, so the previous speakers, you know, they've, they've dealt very well with the question of party democracy and what's happening um, in practical terms where with the right attacking the left, trying to suspend people, trying to marginalize uh, the left uh, in every part of the, the Labour Party and the broader Labour movement increasingly as well. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit about what I think is the reason behind them doing it. Um, because the, sometimes people look at this and the title of this event is, you know, fight the Tories, not the left. Uh, and I think a lot of Labour members look at what's going on in the party and find it completely um, bemusing why a centre left party in, full of social democratic people would be so committed um, in its leadership, at least, um, to trying to purge left wingers and socialists and to try to marginalise us and attack our ideas and whatever else. Um, and I think it's very important that we understand that how they see us. They see the left as some kind of an anomaly, as an oddity, as something that costs the Labour Party votes in elections because our politics are on the fringe. They see us as something which uh, basically doesn't belong in mainstream politics. They really don't believe we are a legitimate political force and they don't think that we deserve uh, the space to, to, to have our ideas heard. Uh, what they don't understand, um, and you know, people around Keir Starmer particularly don't understand, but the entire right wing of the party, is that that is not what the left is. The left represents a social constituency, particularly in the period after the 2008 crash, where there was this great disillusionment built up with millions of people for whom the economy was no longer working. They went and they sought out alternatives to the political system, and they found them through the ideas articulated by Jeremy Corbyn, and through socialist policies, through the kind of policies that we fight for and argue for. And these are the people who actually we represent. These are young people who are screwed by low wages and high rents and student debt. They're people in zero hour jobs and uh, low pay and insecurity in, in work. They're people in communities who've had years and decades of their services being cut uh, and jobs leaving and deindustrialization. There are millions of people across the country who respond not to us as people so much as to what we argue for 
which is a fundamental shift in the political and economic system away from the organized power of the rich and towards a more democratic economy and power in the hands of working people. That's what the left is. And their inability to see that, their you know, stubbornness and their ignorance and refusal to see that leads them into a destructive campaign for this entire party. Because when they attack the left in the party, when they attack Jeremy Corbyn, when they attack Becky Long Bailey, when they attack uh, left wing representatives in local community part, uh, uh, in local constituency parties and local communities around the country, what they do is send a message to all of those people who look to our ideas and our kind of uh, efforts to change society and say, we don't represent you. People see in those attacks on the left, attacks on their aspirations for a better society, and they go elsewhere. And we saw this in Bristol and we saw this in Sheffield, obviously, with people departing to the Green Party. There was a poll out yesterday, or at least a subset of a poll, showing huge swing of young voters away from the Labour Party and towards the Green Party. But it's not just there. People are going towards uh, independence parties. People are going, in some cases, very, very regrettably towards the Liberal Democrats. People are going towards a whole series of different uh, uh, forces uh, and actually more than even any category in terms of uh, party that they're going to. They're going to disillusionment and they're going to non-voting and non-participation and retreating out of the political sphere. And this is catastrophic for Labour because you've got a, this, this country has an extremely strong right-wing supermajority now that is backed up by a right-wing media right-wing business interests, uh, a state apparatus that fights at every turn to try and deny working people the dignity that they deserve in their lives. And the Labour Party needs the broadest possible coalition of opposition to that. Instead of building that coalition, what Keir Starmer and his team are doing is breaking that coalition, in some cases, almost irredeemably, because they are uh, purging people and mounting a campaign of persecution against the left, which is going to alienate people, not for a year or two years, but for large parts of their political life, if they continue to do it. And this is the case that we need to, to be making. And we need to be making very, very strongly to a lot of like activists, rank and file, ordinary activists in the Labour Party, who may not be totally committed to, uh, you know, being on the left or see themselves as, say, Corbynites or even socialists, but they want the better society. And they look at these poll numbers and they see that this isn't working and they're asking what is going on and why is this going so badly wrong? And this is what we need to be saying to them, that in this era, the centre left is going to be defined more than anything else by people who either get the post-crash era of politics or people who don't. And you look at, I have a lot of criticisms, many criticisms of Joe Biden in the United States, way, way further to the right than anything I would like. But he and his team obviously have made an effort to try and build a coalition that will bring in parts of the, uh, the American left. It has been deliberate from the beginning. Now, my view is a lot of his tokenism, but they haven't gone out on a kind of wild purge of the left from the start. And what has it resulted in? It resulted in a very big electoral result for Joe Biden defeating Donald Trump. And it also resulted in uh, some of the strongest poll numbers for a sitting president in, in you know, living memory. And when you look at who's behind that, an awful lot of people who aspire towards change in the economy are backing Joe Biden. Now, whether they stick to that or not over the years, we shall see. But there is a center left figure who's trying to understand, at least he's not one of us, he's not a socialist, but he's trying to understand this new context. We were told for years by the Blairites in this party that we need to be more like the Democrats, we need to be more like the Americans. Now that the Democrats are actually doing a couple of half useful things they're running away from them at a rate of knots. They, they now, now the story is we can't be like Joe Biden. We can't, you know, be making deals with the left. We can't be, you know, trying to fight for any, any uh, left wing policies. Now they want us to go somewhere to the right of where the Democrats in the United States are, which is an absurd situation. And, you know, you see this summed up with things like the Labour Party a few months ago coming out against corporate tax increases. Well, the whole rest of the like, establishment in the world and the developed capitalist world is moving towards higher rates of corporation tax and trying to consolidate more basically, you know, uh, taxation of, of mega corporations. This, this is kind of wildly out of step with where the world is going and it's because these people don't get it. So just to conclude, um, you know, what do I think then we need to do as, as, as a left from, from this point? 
uh, you know, we saw very, very clearly in the May elections what the consequence of this strategy played out over another few months and years is going to be. But we also saw places where our ideas were being put in place and we saw what the result was, where there was broad coalitions being built on the basis of changing society and changing communities in places like in Preston and places like Salford, the result, you know, of, of a uh, left of centre, left uh, of the Labour Party leadership in Wales, we saw there the beginnings, the bones, not perfect scenarios, but examples of how uh, fighting for politics can win, even in this uh, atmosphere, even against an incredibly strong, uh, you know, right wing establishment in this country. And we saw that our uh, alternatives that kind of community politics is actually the best weapon against the Tory culture war. Their reactionary, nationalist, populist program that they're trying to introduce at the moment. The Starmer types have no answer to it other than let's stand in front of more flags. Let's try and throw out another few sound bites from the Sun newspaper. That ain't going to work. What will work is giving people a politics that's rooted in the communities they're from. Like in Preston and in Salford, what they did is they built a sense of connection with where people were. They, res you know, they, they talked again to people who felt like the, the world was moving, the power in the world was moving far away from them. And they gave them a politics with a sense of place and a sense of community. And they tried you know, to build engagement in politics, active grassroots engagement in their political projects. And they were rewarded with good uh, electoral results. And they were able, by talking about you know, the, the history of Preston and the Salford, but also how that history of these places as bastions of the workers' movement could be the future as well. Could be the future in terms of in Salford building social housing for the first time in decades. Could be the future in Preston in terms of trying to find a worker co-op uh, to, to make sure Uber doesn't and take over the, the taxi industry and um, supporting a, a council run uh, cinema, supporting, uh, you know, a local investment bank, supporting cooperative cultural spaces so that our, the main streets aren't just empty. They talked about what that future would look like. And they showed that actually that kind of engaged community based politics can defeat the Tory culture war. And you don't have to go into nonsense, reactionary nationalist bile to do so. Uh, and I think, you know, that is a message we have to take forward here. We have models on the left of the party. And as they fail in this leadership with this destructive strategy of attacking us, we need to go out there. We need to represent the people I've spoken about, those people disillusioned with this economy and political system. We need to be out in our communities, representing them, building connections with them. And when this stammer project of, you know, trying to get to power by marginalizing, attacking, persecuting the left doesn't work, we need to be there with our alternatives actual on the ground alternatives that we can show work and that we can help people to build across the country. Thanks. Thank you, Ronan. I mean, there's so many points you've touched on there um, and such, such great insight. And I, I think I'll mention the disillusionment and, you know, as a, as a, as a young person in Britain, it was so prevalent um, and actually Jeremy's rise to the, to the leader of leadership, the leader of the Labour Party really um, got people engaged and it's something that, if we lose now, we'll, we'll be fighting back for, for a long, long time. Um, and great to see those those highlighted examples of, of where uh, local governments pushing for actual tra transformative change and actually representing their communities has, has had a huge impact. Um, I've got a few comments to make just before we go on to some questions. Uh, firstly, I'd just like to tell you that we've had uh, over a thousand people join today's meeting already. Um, and we have more joining all the time across Facebook, Twitter, zoom and youtube so thank you for taking a part taking part today thanks for everyone who helped build build the event and um we've, we've got a lot more to come so don't go away uh, i've also got a comment i'd like to read out from anna just uh if you bear with me one second um can we ask for a panel member to raise the, the crucially important national constitutional committee election it is a delegate vote at conference Sir Keir Starmer wishes to replace the NCC with a so-called independent non-party unelected body. The grassroots slate has three members standing for another term, committed to the battle to maintain an elected body. There have been attempts to divert cases to the NEC and elsewhere. The, N the NCC is the only hope to protect members and is crucial to party democracy. Um, so if, if some of our speakers are, are interested in, in that, uh, if they could come back on that question, 
as one of them. Uh, I'll just summarise that. Can we can we ask for a panel member to raise the crucially important national constitutional committee election? Um, I've also got an, uh, another few questions here. I'm going to ask uh, one more, and then if we have, uh, maybe just try and answer one each as the speakers. Um, so over the years, much of the left has backed self-organised structures for black women and disabled members in Labour, but the right wing have often reacted against doing this. What, what are the key latest developments with regards to these structures and what should we be doing to advance them? Um, and do we, should we go speaker order? So Pamela, are you to, okay to go first? Um, ooh, goodness, in terms of kind of developing them, this, if you go back several decades ago when we had black sections and women's sections and they were attacked in the same way that the left are under attack now. Um, I have mixed views about them because yes, absolutely, there should be self-organization, but in some ways we need to all be coming together to fight on the common cause around socialism and socialist policies. So, I mean, people will have different views on this because there's marginalization of certain groups. Absolutely, we know that, don't we? So how do we get a voice? How do we get kind of uh, self-organization of disabled people, of black sections, et cetera? Um, at the moment, it seems to be a bit of a losing battle, but we've just got to keep giving that message, don't we? This is what we want. This is what we're demanding. And to just keep at it, really. It feels though that the kind of fundamental thing is around socialism and that that is the key thing at this stage. So I don't know, I haven't got a simple answer for that. I don't know if anybody else has, but. Um... Okay, thanks. Thanks for that, um, Pamela. Um, sorry, it was actually Rachel who spoke first, so we're gonna have Rachel. Yeah. <laughs> you put me on the spot there. I was <laughs> expecting <laughs> Rachel to come and say. <laughs> she may have a better answer than me. Um, Two of my specialist subjects as well. I did mention the National Constitutional Committee in my introduction because it is a really crucial election and um, I'm glad that it's been been raised and it is so important that we uh, four left candidates um, are, are elected at conference, that we get the good delegates to conference by the extended deadline of 9th of July, that people go, they know they have to vote, they get hold of the ballot papers at the right, you know, ahead of other members of their delegation if necessary and um, the chair of that committee has done a tireless work, um, Anna Dyer, who is up for re-election, in, in really standing up for members and trying to um, bring their cases through and, and not get stuck um, in the sort of the mire that is the, um, the Labour's disciplinary processes. And those, those four people will keep championing members' rights and natural justice. And it, it, it's absolutely crucial. On the self-organised structure, this I do believe this is one of the big successes actually of Jeremy's leadership and the democracy review. One of the few that we, we did get, we reformed annual conference, we got rid of contemporary criteria, we, we allowed rule changes to come every year, you know, small things, the things that we've been fighting for for years to make the party more democratic, part of the democracy review. One of the big things is the equality structures, the women's structures. We have been le leading the way, we have got a democratic policy making structure, we can send motions to conference, we have got now got a national women's committee. When I was on the National Executive Committee, we were fighting for the disability structures and the Black, Asian and Minority Ethnic structures to go the same way. As quick, it was a, 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 a difficult fight, but I know that Mish and, and comrades on the NEC now will be continuing that fight and trying to bring those things forward. Because I think self-organisation is the only way that we can make sure the issues uh, in those you know, that are important to women or to black people or to disabled people are, are front and centre and that we have the right policies, people are organised, that we have candidates from those um, those groups and that the representation is not forgotten. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll probably hand over to Mish because I know that he'll have a more up-to-date view of where things are at with those. Yeah, Mish, do you want to take over from that? Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I think Rachel's uh, just touched on the point of the democracy review. Uh, one of the great outcomes of the democracy review was for BAME self-organisation uh, and for BAME members to have their own uh, uh, self-organising structures within the party. As we all know, and Pamela touched, the black sections were very successful in the 80s. However, uh, the great concern was that BAME Labour, which became a completely separate organisation, uh, 
became a moribund defunct organization that became a pocket organization which was for the benefit of one or two individuals and that really let BAME members down. Uh, there are new BAME structures within the Labour Party which we had to fight about and unfortunately uh, for us and uh, the left in on the NEC we voted against BAME Labour who like I said uh, moribund unaccountable body I mean, just an opaque organization who don't represent black asian minority ethnic members have been given voting rights on it so these structures will come into place after conference uh, obviously they're going to come into the rule book but it's up to now uh, for black asian minority ethnic members uh, in the party and the trade unions to actually organize and make sure that this organization actually represents their interests rather than uh, the uh, establishment itself because uh, we really, really had to fight to get democracy into the new structures and even then we failed on votes as well. Thanks for that Nish, yeah very um, informative um, look back and, and look forward I'd say. Um, rather than hammer on those two questions I'd like to ask two separate questions for our last two speakers. Um, so just to pick pick either or, either or please, uh, Maya and Ronan. But um, what can we do to support the whip being restored to Jeremy Corbyn and to see an end to other unjust suspensions? And then finally, why should socialists stick with the Labour Party? I'd just like to say thanks to everyone who's um, sent us these questions as well. Really great to have people engaged. Um, over to you, Maya. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, great um, questions. Uh, I think in terms of getting the whip restored, uh, the CLP motion, CLPD motion that is uh, hopefully going to come to conference uh, on making the um, PLP accountable to conference uh, and therefore uh, issues relating to the whip. I think that's really important. Unfortunately, the deadline's passed, but I'm pretty sure it's gone through several CLP. So fingers crossed. It's, uh, that's going to come and that's really important. Um, and yeah, and to continue because we, um, Jeremy, you know, he was our leader, he's a fantastic leader. He brought so many people into the party. He brought many people who weren't uh, previously involved in politics into the party. And many of those people are the ones that have left in despair. And so fighting for Jeremy to be uh, reinstated to the Parliamentary Labour Party is really important and we should continue uh, to rally around that. Um, I mean, quickly, just in terms of an end to suspensions, uh, it's really tough. It's really, really tough because of the way that because the the way the Labour Party organisation is set up, it's really hard to pursue uh, legal action against them for unjust suspensions. Um, and I'm sure, as we've seen, and, and um, Pamela mentioned. Uh, the uh, socialist journalists who've been expelled from the party, Marxists, um, just yesterday, uh, they're going to carry on. They, they're carrying on, uh, you know, people being suspended 30 minutes before a selections meeting. You know, this is this is their tactic. How we can fight it, you know, keeping a hold of um, those members, making sure they're part of communities of support, making sure they don't internalise uh, the, the, the feeling of being subject to disciplinary action. Um, we need to have resources available for people um, to help them answering their disciplinary questions, um, to give them legal advice. Uh, that's what I have at the moment, but anyone with more ideas on how we can fight it, such a nasty practice, um, please you know, share them. Thank you. Thank you, Maya, thanks for that. Um, Ronan, do you wanna uh, pick up on those two questions as well? just a nice easy one why should socialists stay in the Labour Party um look, I, look on the first instance I'm going to be real I'm not going to browbeat people if they choose to leave because the 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 nature of things in the party right now is um you've got a lot of people who feel that they're a member of an organization and paying subs to an organization and working for an organization that does everything every day of the week to attack them that despises them that has no respect for their views and you know you can't be too critical of people who say they're not prepared to put up with that. But I'm still a member and I'll make a case over why I think people should be. You know, there are a few different reasons. The first is that the Labour Party, for all of its flaws, stands out by contrast to other political forces in this country because of its connection to the Labour movement, because it is the political expression of the organised working class movement, of our trade unions, and that makes it a very different 
uh, entity as a political force, one that is connected to workplaces and communities across the country, one that is, you know, has an, a, a path at least to building a message for socialism that other parties simply don't have. It is the only force that has any chance of bringing together this coalition of disillusioned people that I talked about, which stretches from, you know, post-industrial working class communities and the north of the country and, and kind of, you know, maybe younger urban um, uh, people who are struggling with job and rents and so on um, in, in the bigger cities. You know, this this uh, party is the only hope we have of building the, the kind of broad coalition that you would need um, to, to achieve uh, the change we want to see in society. Yes, the electoral system is what it is. There's no point in us pretending otherwise that Britain has uh, effectively a two-party uh, system. And the Tories, certainly, there's all sorts of debates going on right now about PR. I'm not going to wade into them. What I would say is... There is no path to changing it as of now. The Tories have no interest, absolutely none, in introducing a referendum to change that. And so we have these two parties to give up the arena of struggle, which is the Labour Party, which is the representation of our unions, and which is the final and key point for me, which is the largest concentration of socialists in any organisation in this country. The largest number of people we would consider comrades of any organisation are in the Labour Party. They might be disparate, they might be disillusioned, they might find things difficult at the moment, but they're there. Um, and to abandon that terrain of struggle, which is a tough one and a pain in the ass a lot of the time, I'm not like naive about any of that, but to abandon all of that to, you know, the right wing interests within, within our party uh, would be a huge tactical strategic mistake. We need to go now and do long, hard yards of work to rebuild the left. And we need to get ourselves, like I said, into a position where we've got strength in the community, we're in touch with working class people, we know what their, their interests and aspirations are, uh, we have models we can show, and that when the next opportunity comes, the left needs to be better organised, and it needs to be united, and it needs to be ready to take it, because these economic crises that we're seeing at the moment are not going anywhere. Thank you, Ronan. Yeah, I mean, the, the Labour Party is just the single biggest vehicle for change in this country, isn't it? And uh, Having so many socialists still involved is, like we found out today, a huge asset and, and something that we can all uh, work towards and work together for uh, more transformative change in the future. Um, we're, we're running out of time now, so I'd just like to thank everyone for speaking and also just everyone for taking part, all of you joining from, from home or from your garden in the sun, wherever you might be. Um, we have hugely important battles ahead and we know just how important our campaigning is to defend Labour Party democracy, our socialist principles, uh, and, our, and our vision for a better world. Um, whether that's through organising for party conference, campaigning for fully self-organised, properly supported, democratic, women's disabled, youth and BAME structures, or by fighting to restore the whip to Jeremy Corbyn. Um, just want to say for all the latest on these campaigns and, and, and from uh, a few of our speakers that we've had today, um, please check out Arise's sister a media partner, which is Labour Outlook. Uh, there should be a few links in the chat and they, and they would have been going throughout. Um, additionally, and as this discussion and others today have shown, there is uh, much more work to be done beyond the party, the party itself, you know, as well as drawing inspiration from that wider movement, we can be a part of that wider movement too. Um, and we'll be discussing this and more in our next session. I'd also like to specifically mention the People's Assembly protest on June 26th, where uh, Arise and, and Labour Assembly Against Austerity will be holding a Labour block. Uh, you can find out more about that in the chat, so please do come and join us there. We're going to be obviously socially distanced and, res and, and respecting the, um, the practices to keep us all safe, but we will be protesting on June 26th. Um, and please also take on board all the other actions that have been posted in the chat, including donating, as I mentioned earlier, which is just so important for us to keep being able to organise events like these and, and just continue our campaigns. Um, we are coming to a close now, but please don't go anywhere. I'll be moving from the chair seat to an attendee like yourselves. Uh, our next session starts at 2 p.m. Uh, after a short lunch break and features Shami Sakrabati and Diane Abbott. From Black Lives Matter to Kill the Bill, defend our right to resist, build, build a movement rooted in solidarity and struggle. Remember, if you're joining on Zoom or YouTube, you can stay throughout the day. If you're uh, with us on Facebook, we'll be starting a new live after the lunch break. So thank you very much. And thanks, everyone, for taking part.